בוקר טוב, שמחים להיות פה, שמח להיות פה. אני מאוד שמחה להיות פה היום. The topic of the first session, as Sharon said, is opportunities and threats in the Middle East, and I think we can talk about the opportunities and risks, and this is an opportunity to say significant things, and the risk is the clock that is running. We have exactly 24 minutes and 14 seconds, and the risk is that Mr. Amos Gilad will get up and kick us off the stage after 25 minutes. So this is an opportunity and a threat, so let's try to balance the two. It seems that the substantial change is happening at a very, high, a very significant level in here in our neighborhood. As the new world order changes the threats, I'm sure many of the people here in this room spent most of our we've spent most of our lives. I was in the intelligence corps until. 96, 97, and the main issue was the alert about war with Syria. And that was the focus, that the resources in Israel were invested in, in the intelligence world in Israel was to alert of a potential war with Syria uh, with enough uh, far enough in advance to recruit the res military reserves. And who talked about uh, Iran at the time? And now, the, now Iran is the attribution Attributed threat for every, that defines policy here and all, in many places around the world. And maybe this is the starting point for this discussion. What opportunities does this situation present for Israel, in which the Arab countries have, d d when, have dropped from the top, of, from the highest risk, to potential partners for normalization and cooperation with Israel? And what do we do with Iran? With Iran who was always considered more a more distant threat, but is now the most significant one, as the Minister of Defense said just a few minutes ago. So I would like to start with you, Moshe Albo, senior researcher here at IPS at Reichman University. How do you see this situation from the perspective of the most influential factor on the global order? from the political and national perspective here in Israel, and what challenges does this pose for Israel? I think that there are several significant uh, factors that are shaping the situation, and uh, to continue the, fa the fascinating fin economic lecture that we began with today, the president of Egypt and the king of Jordan, the first thing that they do is that they look at the economic data, and they look at the nutritional safety and the supply chain chain of products that they have to supply the civilians and he realizes that the tsunami is something that has to be contented with. And the second factor is from the geopolitical perspective, the Iranian measures that are undermining stability in the region are increasing and the U.S., which was always something that we that, that supported us, was something that gave them security to back them is something that's cracking in the Gulf from the in, in the Gulf region from their perspective the attacks there and also the priorities in Washington on the international perspective and how that's reflected in US investment in the region and this is causing different processes then the first one is to is to stabilize the regimes in the area. And also with regard to Israel, there, are, there is the security aspect, but also for the first time, there's a focus on the economic aspect as well. And we are seeing significant processes that have developed over the year, last year or two of opening economic channels in places that didn't exist beforehand. So you're saying that the defining event, the main as the, the, the con a, a contributing factor was the low, is the lower US profile in the region. It's no longer at the, t at the top of the US pi priority. US is focusing maybe on China and Russia and coping with the outcome of the pandemic. So it might be a good, might, so maybe we can say that it's a good thing that, it, that, the, uh, that the US is losing interest. Netanyahu 
and soon we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of his policy regarding Iran. We, all, we know that he was one of the greatest critics of the, G of the agreement, but he said that the only good thing that came out of it is the like-mindedness that was created between Israel and the Arab countries, and that's a reflection of the U.S. withdrawal from the region because the U.S. prefers diplomacy over boots on the ground. So maybe it's good that the U.S. is pulling back a little bit and giving the Arab countries the sense that they can't count on the U.S. on U.S. defense anymore and they have to be more dependent on Israel. Dennis Ross wrote not long ago that there are, there are strategic implications to harming the United States. If Iranian proxies are attacking, attacking U.S. interests, they this lack of this low dr this drop in confidence has significant implications for the region and that's why we see, uh, see today we saw yesterday during the visit in the UAE we saw the large US delegation that came to renew the strategic relationship with the countries and bridge the gaps that have been formed from the Israel perspective it is in Israel's best interest that the US US strength remains present in the region because it gives leverage to Israel as well and has a value that is constantly increasing. So we don't have to look at it as something black or white because in the dangerous scenario in which the regional countries change their supporters significantly and go and, toward and turn towards Russia or China, this will have implications for the long term for Israel and for Israel's strategy. I don't know if you believe in God, but in this case, God is time. So very briefly, because I have to move on, can you tell me the reduced US lowering, US lowering its profile in the region? This was triggered not only by the current president, but this is something that has been, this is a change that has has been developing in U.S. society over the last years. Is there a way to preserve force or the sense of force or determine of the U.S. force in the region without them paying the price that they'll have to pay? Because they're say, you're saying that they have to demonstrate power, but they don't want to lose soldiers here. So when Trump when Trump loses a drone, they don't they, they don't respond. He doesn't he doesn't demand a military response because they don't want to be drawn into an endless war. So do you have something that you can tell them, a recommendation for how they could avoid entering a war like in Vietnam while also supporting the Arab countries and maintaining their force? I don't think they need us. They're smart enough and they have a very strong security. Uh, uh, security uh, apparatus there. The U.S. Uh, influence is not only military. The U.S. is a superpower that can provide military and economic support and help guarantee the nutritional security and its ability to demonstrate forces not only from the military's perspective, it has other opportunities as well. And it is using them. We already see efforts to increase the U.S. footprint in the region through financial assistance and weapon supply. Also, with regard to preserving U.S. deterrence, we saw some at, uh, the attacks about two weeks ago that was attributed to the United States. And this, the U.S. has to exercise more force uh, when it and its allies are attacked in order to maintain its deterrence without, enter, without entering a, an all-out war, which it is not interested in because its focus now is on China, Russia, and North Korea. Thank you very much. And hello, Professor Litvak. Your specialty is Iran, and the Minister of Defense spoke at length about this topic. The common assumption among many is that Trump's withdrawal from the nuclear agreement was had good intentions and it helped Iran from the perspectives that the Ministry of Defense presented, it brought it closer to the brink of nuclear power, of, nu of nuclear power. So do you think in the current situation as you see it, in Vienna there are deliberations about whether to sign an agreement with Iran or not, do you think that an agreement from your understanding of the Iranian regime, will an agreement like that help keep 
keep Iran at a safe distance from a nuclear bomb, assuming that they're already quite close and you can turn back time, and that what they already have will not be taken away from them. Maybe the current situation in which we're not committed to anything, we can continue to attack and put pressure on Iran and continue to blow up centrifuges in Natanz without an agreement. I don't think what you said is a popular opinion. I think it's a very unpopular opinion. In Israel, the popular opinion is that the lack of an agreement, the lack of the agreement is better for Israel, but I tend to disagree. I think that no matter how bad the agreement was, it gave us time. It slowed down the Iranians. But for the long distance, it serves our interests. Are you really you think that the majority in Israel the majority of Israelis think support Trump's withdrawal. I thought that there was a consensus about how about the alternative. I think that, that no matter how bad the agreement was, it was better than no agreements, agreement. Iran up, kept up its side of the agreement, at least for, mo for most of the time. So as horrific as the Iranian regime is, I don't think that Iran really wants a bomb. I think that from the Iranian perspective, it wants to be on the brink of a nuclear bomb. Isn't, it, isn't that the way it is right now? Yes, but it could always be worse. On the threshold, on the brink, that could be a year away or two weeks away. The, Jap the Japanese are a month away from the developing a nuclear bomb if they want to, but they're not interested. And there's a difference. The difference it's better for us for that gap to be as large as possible, to be as far away as possible. And an agreement could be better, could improve the situation. I'm not a strategist, but Israel, with all the efforts it has made, and the efforts were very important, and it was not able to stop the Iranian development, maybe slow it down, but we haven't been able to stop it. Let me ask you a question. Has Israeli activity during Omer, Sharon, and Dagan efforts were made to assassinate scientists and foreign press and exploding, uh, keeping everything in the foreign press. And later, Netanyahu and Yossi Cohen, they prevented centrifuges from being able to operate in Natanz and other efforts that have been made in the last few months. The slowing them down or keeping them at a distance from assembling the gun, it maybe that's what it what is necessary. Didn't those efforts prevent Iran from becoming nuclear? I don't think so. I think that it is an Iranian decision that it is Iranian in, in Iran's best interest not to build a nuclear bomb at this time. I am not underestimating uh, underestimating Iran. It is horrible, and its and its top priority is to destroy us. But I think that at this stage the Iranian regime has decided has not decided to build a nuclear bomb and we may we have to take into account that our efforts may push them towards choosing to develop to create a bomb I, there are two other issues that I want to talk about in the context of Iran it's true that Iran is a very aggressive and active negative player in the Middle East but we also have to look at the problems that Iran is suffering from in the Middle East that can serve us not only its rapprochement with the Sunni countries which is good but also the problems that it's encountering with its Shiites allies there is Iraq is is becoming very more critical of Iran. Although it is a failing and backwards country, it is still, is still opposing Iran. There in Lebanon, there are there is dis discomfort with, uh, with Iranian involvement, and efforts are being made to prevent Iran from taking action there. And this has implications for Israel. I think that Israel should try to work in Iraq to make con to collaborate with parties with people in U in Iraq that see Iran as more as more dangerous than Israel. In the Iraqi parliament, a, a bill was passed following the, dis the, the developments with the Kurdish region. There was a bill, a bill was passed in the Iraqi parliament that prevents, that, that prohibits any type of negotiations with Israel. I think that we can work it with Iraq, with certain forces in Iraq, just to cause harm to Iran. And another point that I want to emphasize is that there are processes inside Iran 
that are working against the regime and will weaken Iran in the long in, for the long term. And in addition, there is a significant economic crisis. Just yesterday, I saw data that said that inflation in Iran was 735 percent in the last 10 years, which is an incredible figure. Iran has very challenging demographic developments that have put challenges upon Iran that are very severe. It is facing an acute water crisis that will get even worse over the next few years and put the regime at a life, at a threat, threaten the, the very existence of the regime. These policies are working against Iran and in favor of Israel for the long term. So the uh, reasonable Israeli policy, I'm not saying to sit back and do nothing or to trust in the goodwill of the Iranians or the Iraqis. I think that we have to be alert, but I think that the time is in our favor. So it has to be in our interest to take action in a sm intelligent way, to buy time, not avoid direct hostilities because time is working against the regime and re against Iran. The question is, is the, quant is the quantitative threat, will it become a more fundamental threat? These sanctions are what brought Khamenei to the negotiations table in 2013 and brought him to the historical compromise in 2015 that enabled the agreement in, uh, during that year. But so far, we have not seen that all of the efforts for maximum pressure and uprisings in Iran, not in 2019, and in all the demonstrations from 2017 until today did not bring the regime to decide between its survivability and abandoning the nuclear program. Why do you think that'll change in the future? Why do you think all of the parameters that you mentioned will accumulate into critical mass that will impact the regime and change its policy. Let's say, the, regime, the Iranian regime will not become pacifist. No, I needed to say they will abandon the nuclear program. That will never happen. That's not something that's going to happen. We have to be realistic. Working to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear bomb, I, th don't th I think they're striving for the capability, not for the bomb itself. And we have to make sure not to push them to strive to develop a bomb. And I think that is something that will encourage them to join negotiations. Iran will not abandon its efforts to develop nuclear power because it has regional imperial goals and because it's an aggressive regime. When the Iranians look at the world around them, they realize that their understanding is that you don't have nuclear deterrence, then they have nothing. Look at Ukraine, look at North, and North Korea. But I have, a, I, want, I have a question for you. Those who object to the agreement say the following. They say, at every given moment, you're right, the agreement push kept it further away from obtaining a nuclear bomb. With, uh, but it's like a... But it's like someone who's jumping off the 50th floor, and at floor 23, you ask him how he's doing, he says, everything's okay. Uh, what about the sanctions? Let's, I'll try to represent those who object to the agreement for the purpose of this conversation. When the agreement expired, then Iran, Iran would receive authorization, per official permission to develop nuclear energy, and which it hadn't done for the last 15 years. The question is, what would have happened when the agreement expired? We reach this point now, not in 2025. And even after the agreement would have expired and the sanctions would be revoked, it doesn't allow Iran to do everything it wanted. There are still limitations on Iran. Politics is not deciding between good and bad, between what I want in life and what reality is. Pol politics is, in many cases, choosing between the bad and the worse. And there is that the worst is to abandon the agreement and let them do whatever they want. I disagree. I think that an agreement with all its problems, the reality was less problematic than it is now without an agreement in which Iran can do whatever it wants. And we have to remember something else. The international arena, we talked about the withdrawal of the US from the agreement. China and Russia did not support the US efforts policy of pressure on Iran on the one hand, but on the other hand, I don't think that either China or Russia want Iran to be a nuclear power, and I think Iran is aware of that. 
And I also think that Iran is aware that if they obtain nuclear weapons, it will cause a weaponization race in the region. Turkey and maybe even Egypt may become nuclear, and that is not good for Iran. So as horrible as the regime is, it is not crazy, it is rational. And I think that this is something that will deter Iran. It's not ideal, it would be best if Iran didn't have those capabilities, but that is a given at this time. And I think that the, the discussions, the dialogue we had so far did not, was not helpful. There were the tactical efforts. Did they make a strategic difference? I don't think so. And I think that we need a policy that we can't underestimate the Iranian threat, but the approach of of attack, of using extensive force, I'm not sure, sure that that would be effective or effective for Israel. My microphone, our, uh, uh, our correspondent from Khan One, correspondent for Arab issues. We heard before about different threats that we face, and one is related to the one that's related to the security in the lands of Israel. He said the last threat that was mentioned. Maybe not the least important, but it was still the last one mentioned. And it seems that the Copernic revolution puts Israel at the forefront of the battle. Part of the process was breaking the paradigm of the Arab countries that said that they would not normalize relations with Israel. That connection was broken, and they said that they would no longer be willing to risk their political and economic situation for Abu Mazen and the objection goals, uh, policies. And this put the Palestinian issue deep into the drawers. And it seems that now we can take out the, we can start snacking together and sit back and relax. I don't think it was draw, it was put in the drawer. I think that we see all the threats, everything that's been happening the last week, last few weeks. But the rapprochement between Arab countries and Israel is certainly positive, but it's very, and it's very active. It's reflected in daily um, aspects. We see um, critics that come and go. This is something that we could have only dreamed of two or three years ago. But in the Palestinian context, there are developments that are happening all the time, and it's passive. It's not something we can see. It's very difficult to put your finger on it. There is, you only see the dangerous implications. And uh, my friends, uh, my colleagues, and I see these uh, demonstrations as becoming more and more severe. What is the what type of developments are you talking about? Um, uh, just a short br r overview of where the pal where the Palestinians try to describe their experience. Just over the last few years, they lost most of their political and non political and diplomatic and non diplomatic assets. When we talk about the Abraham Accords, that's the last thing that happened. But beforehand, they were divided. It's not it wasn't us that divided them, but from their perspective, it is a significant problem. They saw or experienced the distancing of the U.S., as you mentioned before, Moshe mentioned it before. They saw how the U.S. authority as a mediator in the region and kind of a responsible adult in the region. Whenever Abu Mazen had problems with us, he would go and call the Americans and ask them to get involved. And they would always kind of work things out, but the Americans aren't interested anymore. From the Palestinian perspective, the responsible adult isn't in the area anymore. And Israel, the Israeli government, not only the government, the current government, the Netanyahu regime stopped negotiations. But now we're go this government went even further. He said, we're not interested, it doesn't interest us, it doesn't interest the world. What's happening now is tactical dealings, different benefits in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip and with the PA. We are always talking about governance and how valid it is. Look from the bottom, look at the 
Palestinian citizen who looks at the lack of governance, who says the is the Jews, the Israelis aren't taking care of me, the PA is non-existent, Hamas is far away, even, even if it's not far away, the civilian citizens in the Gaza Strip don't see Hamas as a regime that has any type of of, of national vision. What did the Hamas? What does Hamas have to offer to the civilians and to citizens of the Gaza Strip? So the development, if we can summarize it just in a word, it is there is rivalry that is developing, which has tactical implications, but it could be it could develop into strategic problems with Palestinian citizens. The leader, forget, put the leaderships aside for now. But if we look at the Palestinian citizens, and it might be it will be problematic. And over the last month, we saw the lone attacks that are no longer knife attacks. Now you have lone attackers, lone terrorists who enter Israeli cities. How do we cope with that? You could blame everyone for these things, the Noir, Abu Mazam, anyone, but we're the ones who are coping with the problem. And that is a development. If you're asking me about developments or about what we're facing, then we are a f we are fortified. Um, we, are, we have fortification. We have excellent agreements in the region. But the problem is inside here. Is inside our country. Look at the headlines in the Idiot Chrono today in Uma Fachem. There is there are objections to an IDF exercise being ha going on in Uma Fachem because it's simulating a the occupation of a city in Lebanon. So we're over time. We, we've used up our time, so just in a word. We have to end now. Okay, so we'll have to end with that. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. Thank you to you.